Resolute Square. There was also maintained what was called an enemy's list, which was rather extensive and continually being updated. Democrats want Republicans dead. Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? The women with the least likelihood of getting pregnant are the ones most worried about having abortions. On January 6th of 2021, you had tens of thousands of people peacefully protesting. So, it's not a right-wing conspiracy theory. It's not QAnon. It's real. <laughs> I'm Rick Wilson, and this is The Enemies List. Hi, folks, and welcome back to The Enemies List. I'm your host, Rick Wilson. Joining me today is a really insightful guy who knows the ins and outs of Trump world and the cases being played out against him. It's Hugo Lowell. He's the political investigations reporter for The Guardian. And if you're not following him on Twitter uh, and on threads, you are making a huge mistake because he knows what's going on. Hugo, welcome to The Enemies List. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thanks for having me. So give us the rundown. Uh, right now, Trump is in a moment of high drama and the cases are are closing in on all sides. What's your take and what's your feeling on where they are mentally and legally in the in the course of of of, uh, as I like to jokingly say, entering the finding out phase? Well, I think uh, he may yet find out for indictment number four uh, and maybe even next week. Uh, when Fulton County brings its indictment, I think, you know, Trump's in this position now where every time he has to go into a courtroom to enter a not guilty plea, it still hits him like it's the first time. You know, when we sure. were in the courthouse in D.C. on Thursday, you know, he had to take two attempts to say his age and two attempts to say his name. And, you know, you would have thought by now with all of the indictments, it would be you'd be a little bit more slick in this but i think you know mm -hmm. those kind of slips are indicative of the fact that it still hits him in a way that is uh very visceral for him and very real and he will certainly be very angry coming out of that courthouse afterwards and when he was on the plane going back to Bedminster. so uh, that is something I, I i think you will probably have some real like insights into a lot of the blustering and the ranting and the and the chest thumping on Truth Social, it really is quite different from the reality of how this is hitting him in in a in a in an actual rea real way in in behind when the cameras aren't on and when he's not out truthing. Yeah, I mean, in in private, I think he's still he still gets rocked by these kind of really negative legal developments, right? I mean, and we were talking about even before the first indictment how. You know, he has all this bravado and how he likes to project this image that he's defiant um, in, in the face of these prosecutors coming after him. But in private and then, you know, the trips back from rallies and, you know, when he's just with his senior staff on the plane, uh, the, the kind of the reporting that we have is he is much more sullen and much more grim. And I think Trump has got to the point where he knows that these these legal problems are starting to pose kind of existential threats to him. Um, mm -hmm. I think though it does boost him from a from a political side. You know, he you know his his aides talk about sure. how he's literally running for freedom now, and if he's right. going to avoid jail, he has to win. And so I think that has invigorated him from a campaign side in maybe a way that I don't think people necessarily uh, anticipated. I think that's right. I think he certainly um, mentally, I think he he understands that this is an existential race. One of the questions I, I've been curious about, I mean, as we know, Trump has been through, I think so, someone had a count the other day. He's been through like 34 attorneys in the last five years of various things. Do, do, does he have confidence in the team he's got now? And why did he end up landing on? On, on the people that are representing him at the moment. Um, and I know some of them are more public than others. Um, you know, like most people aren't hearing about Chris Kyes, but they are hearing about um, uh, about uh, uh, Alina Hababa and uh, and the new guy I'm, whose name is escaping me at the moment. 
there's so many so often. The, the team that he has right now is the team he can get. And it's probably the best he can get. You know, it's, these lawyers aren't pushover lawyers. Um, and I think that's important right, to right, know, right. right? Todd Blanche, um, who's representing him in both the documents case and the federal January 6th case, used to be the chief of the criminal division in the Southern District of New York. He's a former partner at Cadwell. Right, he's a serious guy. He is a real attorney. He's a real, right, real defense trial attorney. Um, and John Lauro, too, um, at least in the, in the January 6th case, he's not working on the, on the, on the documents case. You know, he's also a serious lawyer. Um, I think the, the, the issues are not so much lawyers themselves, but the entanglements that they're going to find themselves in in the weeks and months ahead because they mm-hmm. all represent a lot of different people in Trump world, all of whom may have varying degrees of legal exposure in all of these different cases. You know, just as an example, um, you know, Todd Blanche, he ended up Trump's lawyer because he was originally Boris Epstein's lawyer. <laughs> um, Boris Epstein may well be an unindicted co-conspirator in the January 6th case. Right. You know, if Todd has to represent the, both people, that's going to be an issue in terms of conflicts because where's his true loyalty is going to lie? If you talk sure. to the lawyers who used to be on the team, they would actually say that maybe Todd's original loyalty is with Boris because they go back a, you know, a long time. He has been Boris's attorney for a long time. Mm-hmm. And Todd is always looking out to protect Boris. So that's an interesting dynamic. Interesting. As with you know someone like um, Evan Corcoran, you know, that's a different problem because there you have another attorney who was originally involved in the documents case. Um, it's no longer because he had to recuse himself after he got, you know, subpoenaed to testify before the grand jury and his notes ended up, you know, <laughs> as the primary form of evidence in the obstruction case in, 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 right, in, in the Mar- in Mar-a-Lago uh, side of things. But he made a cameo appearance in the courtroom for the arraignment because he's still involved in like an advisory role and like a kind of briefing role on the January 6th case. And so, again, you have this kind of conflict as to can you really represent Trump when you yourself are a witness against that same client in a separate criminal case? And I think that's where the problems are going to start metastasizing uh, as we go through to trial. Is there someone who is like the air traffic controller now for all the all the attorneys? Is there, is there someone? Because it sounded like for a while Boris was playing that role, but I don't, uh, I'm, I'm hearing it's not the case anymore. Is there someone who's like the like, like trying to, to deconflict and coordinate all these, all this, this army of attorneys. Uh, yeah, it's tricky, right? Because Boris, I think, still does occupy some role. You know, he is, he is the self-titled in-house counsel. You know, he is, and in in, in many ways, he does over, still oversee stuff because, as, right. as we were saying, like Todd is his own attorney, and so you know, he is very good at. Boris is very good at kind of gaining information and kind of accumulating information from the dim- different criminal cases, and he can synthesize it in a way um, that I think other people cannot. And that is his one kind of major strength: is he is good at figuring out how the different pieces fit together. If if only for his own benefit, but you know, nonetheless, um, you know, Alina Harbour, she is now the general counsel for the Save America PAC, and when she was right. installed as general counsel and the spokesperson, there was a sense that, oh, maybe Alina will be, um, will be kind of leading the teams in a, in, in a kind of in a managerial sense. But I think she has been, she has found it difficult to navigate some of the internal politics, not least because okay. Boris is good at elbowing people out, but I think it's yes. complicated. <laughs> Interesting. And I, 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 I just wonder, I mean, he's got, he's got so many different streams running at one time. I, I mean, this doesn't strike me as something that Trump himself would be particularly able to, to follow the ball on all these things. It, 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 these are enormously multivariate, complex problems. And, and knowing Trump, he's a fairly fixated guy. He'll get on one thing for a little bit and then, and then, move on to the next thing he's he doesn't strike me as a guy who has the and i'm not just trying to be be you know dismissive i i don't know that he has the mental wherewithal to cut to hold all these threads in his head at one time about the about how all the interactions he has on social media etc can can affect all the different threads in the cases that he's facing 
Yeah, and I'm not sure that he is actually kind of tracking it either, right? Like over the weekend, for instance, in the in the January sixth case, you saw him, you know, posting on 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 Truth Social, oh, you know, we want we want a we want a different judge, we want to move this out of DC, and actually right. it ended up being that John Laro, the lawyer, was responding to the truth and being like, well, actually, you know maybe we won't go that far yet. Like, and that was even on the Sunday shows. Like that wasn't even, we haven't even gotten the core finals yet. Right. So <laughs> right. I think there is an element of Trump leading his lawyers and, you know, John kind of Lara trying to make sure he doesn't fall off the apple cart. Um, and, you know, it, it, I think it's really difficult and, you know, eventually Lara will figure out how to uh, kind of how to, not manage Trump because no one ever manages Trump, but no one ever how to work with him in a way that's cohesive. And I don't think that's happened yet. To switch from the from the the legal world of Trump, which is you know where everybody's sort of obsessing to the political world, um, it's fairly obvious that that you know all of us who've been longtime Trump observers that the Republican primary is is kind of going nowhere right now. It's kind of fixated in in a place where Trump is in the mid fifties and everybody else is in the best case in the mid teens and mostly in the single digits uh, in the field. What does Trump think about the field right now? What is he, how, what's his sort of take on the, from your reporting and your knowledge, what's his sort of take on where they are vis-a-vis DeSantis vis-a-vis, you know, uh, the, the, the handful of people that are, that are actually poking against him. Um, and, and what is it? What, how does he view the field right now? and the race right now. I think he's pretty happy with where he is. And, you know, I, I wouldn't blame him, right? He's right. He's <laughs> far and away ahead of DeSantis. As one would. You know, <laughs> right. You know, I think in November, when, when we were chatting about his, his launch and, you know, how right. it was low energy and kind of how he didn't really seem invested in it, I think he, you know, if nothing else, he is vindictive and, he has, you know, he, he likes his retribution and and he has come back to the point of like saying, oh, you know, people thought my campaign was low energy. Well, you know, where are we now? Like, you know, Ron, Ron DeSantis or, you know, Ron DeSantis, as he says, right, is right. Is, is trailing. I think there's a new poll out that puts him uh, very similar to Chris Christie. Um, yeah. I think I think the camp the campaign is is very happy with where they are. They're very happy in terms of the poll numbers. They're very also happy with the with the fundraising. You know, there are a lot of stories a couple of weeks ago about mm-hmm. how the legal funds were draining his his kind of campaign coffers. But I think people weren't delineating between the leadership pack, the super pack, and the campaign. Right. And the campaign is right. actually financially pretty healthy still. Um, and Trump's so got I think the campaign money. as a whole is trying to. Right, right. I don't think that is that is really a concern at all, if I'm honest. Um, and at the moment, they're they're trying to you know they're trying to capitalize on the fact that everything that is in the news about the Republican primary race is centered around Trump. And every time DeSantis has to ask, answer a question, it's oh, what do you think about Trump? What do you what think about, about the Trump? indictments? What about Trump? And it just bogs yep. everyone out. And that's exactly where Trump wants it, right? Yeah, I think that's right, Hugo. I, th- I think there's a sense of, uh, of in Trump's world of, you know, all these other guys are hoping for some like exogenous event, some externality that comes in and says, oh, he's suddenly magically in jail or he dies of a heart attack or whatever. A- and and you and I both know this is a guy who if if Trump has nothing else, he's got the luck of the devil. And, and you know, he is he's going to live to be 100. He's going to be around vexing us for a long time. And the and any any idea that he's going to go to jail is like so far off. And I tell my Democratic friends this a lot. It's like, guys, you're not going to have Donald Trump in prison campaigning. It's not going to be that way. These cases are going to drag and drag and drag. Even if you think that Jack Smith and everyone else wants it to move quickly, this is not going to happen overnight. None of this is. I think Trump understands that. You know, I, 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 I is that one of the reasons he's sort of like the performative stuff aside. There is a certain sense of like. You know, I'm going to be the nominee in his head. He doesn't. I don't think he sees any any a risk from these other from the seven dwarves in the campaign. No, I think you know, as Bannon would put it, like you know, the Keebler elves. He does not see them as any sort of threat whatsoever. And right. I think there is an element where he he quite rightly thinks that a lot of these cases either will go to trial right up against the election, in which case he can turn into a circus, or they will come after the election. Um, 
And at that point, you know, it, it doesn't really really matter anymore. What matters is if he, if he won the election or not. Um, right. And he does see that as a a protective veil, and he's not thinking about this day to day because he knows it's kind of uh, kind of off far away. And I think that's kind of how he kind of rationalizes it, and that's certainly how his team rationalizes it because they're like, look, you know, there are going to be a million things that happen between now and election day, and there's going to be a million things that happen between now and these trials. You know, I, I just you know just just as an example, I remember Thanksgiving last year when we were talking about Nick Fuentes and like the right. the, the dinner that he had at Mar. I can't right, remember Jay's, that. Like it the, was so yeah. right. So I think that's kind of where the campaign is at and where kind of Trump's headed that. How do you feel about the campaign at, at this year? I mean I look I look at them, I'll I'll give my opinion on it just, you know, candid. I've said this publicly. Susie Wiles and Chris LaCevita are a professional jump up on the scale from the sort of chaotic machine that existed both in 16 and 20. Um, they're actual political operatives. They're actual real people who who didn't just come out of like kissing Trump's ass the right way, like a Corey Lewandowski or, or a Kellyanne Conway. These are serious people. Um, how is uh, I mean, how are they? They seem like they're managing him on the political side better than I've ever seen him manage before. I think that's right. I think, you know, their vote's very, very competent. And it's a very, and it's a very small team, small senior leadership team, which I think is is beneficial for Trump. You know, when he has the sprawling group of people, you know, with all of their individual agendas, it is you know right. difficult to stay on message and run a kind of a, a slick campaign. Right now, you know, they really do have Chris and Susie running a very very tight ship. And, you know, and you sure. and you see it on the travel actually. You know, every time he goes to a rally, every time he goes mm-hmm. to like an arraignment, it's the same very small circle of people. It's basically Susie Wiles, Chris Asavida, um, Stephen Chung, the spokesperson, Jason Miller sometimes, right. Boris Epstein sometimes, um, you know, um, Justin Cap rally for advance. And that's it. And, that, mm-hmm. and that's it. That's the, that's the people he's dealing with. It's the same people he's dealing with day in, day out. They're very candid with him. I think he trusts them inherently, which is... I think very big for Trump and the way he kind of functions is I think he feels like he needs to have a group of people where he can be kind of just himself. Um, You know, when reporters on the plane, for instance, I think he feels really inhibited and, you know, I think he's a little, yeah, from everyone we've spoken to and everything we've seen, he tries to be more reserved. You know, he's not so liberal on his, on his music choices. He's not so liberal on kind of what he's, what he's talking about. And kind of the phrasing and language he uses, and I think that's very indicative. Um, I think it's important for him that he has a very small team. That's interesting, <clears throat> and I've, I've I've been following what, what what I call the the biggest barometer of whether whether Trump is is doing well or not is whether Jared and Ivanka try to come back in. Have you heard anything about that? Because there have been a f- couple of articles in the last few days, and and some whispers in the wind that oh, Jared's taking a, a, a greater interest in the campaign suddenly. Yeah, if Jared's taking interest in the campaign, that's probably uh, a sign that um, he thinks there's uh, there's upside for him, um, <laughs> uh, which 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 may be um, which may or not may or may or may not be what the campaign necessarily wants. You know, I think right. it's still very early. You know, we talk about these campaigns now like this is the same team that's going to go through to the general election, and as you know, in Trump world. Any number of you know, everyone has their day in the barrel, right? That's how they talk about it. Mm-hmm. Everyone has a day in the barrel. Everyone's going to screw up at some point, and if that means they're going to get fired, or maybe they don't get fired, but they get or demoted. Layered. Like yeah. everyone knows that's a right. That's always a possibility, and I don't think anyone is taking anything for granted right now, uh, which is probably the best approach if you're going to work for Trump. Um, right. And all of these guys on the campaign now. Are veterans of Trump world and they know how it operates. Um, mm-hmm. And so I don't think they're under any illusion that, you know, that down the line, if Trump is the nominee and he looks like he's going to win, Jared might jump in or Ivanka might jump in um, because they see kind of upside for them in a, you know, in a potential administration, second administration, for instance. <laughs> you know, I used to call Jared the secretary of everything. When he was, uh, you know, I mean, because I would hear from people in the White House and it was always like, 
he's in this meeting. He just pops in. He just like weighs in on everything. He he he, he says things like, I, "I'm speaking for the president directly." When I knew he wasn't speaking for the president directly, I just I. I but he will be the barometer of whether the Trump enterprise feels like the, the victory is in sight again. He'll be back, I think, in that case. So changing tracks for one second, uh, I don't want to talk about the primary field again for just a minute. You and I have spoken a couple of times about Ron DeSantis, and I, I am still – I have been around this game a long time, and I've seen the flavor of the year kind of guys uh, over and over and over again, whether it's Jeb or Marco or Ted or Scott Walker or Tim Pawlenty or whoever – and I remember when they were rolling out their 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 team, and everyone was just like in awe of all the money that he had. Are you, have you been doing much reporting or, or, or paying much attention to that as as he sort of like implodes, collapses, whatever the word you want to use is? Um, and 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 as the Republican elites turn their eyes to some new dream date for their Trump replacement. Yeah, I mean, just on a very kind of superficial level, because I'm not you know, assigned to the DeSantis sure. campaign or the DeSantis beat. Um, but, you know, in in March and April, we did have some reporting about, you know, his leadership team and how it was, and, you know, we kind of broke the story about how uh, he did. had pulled in these, these Tallahassee people and that it was very, very mm-hmm. like local Republican party or kind of small time um, Republican senatorial committee sort of staffers right. that he had brought in because him and Casey wanted to manage their presidential bid in the same way that they, they managed the governor's mansion, how they managed his gubernatorial race. And mm-hmm. everything that we predicted then in terms of how that wouldn't scale, I think has turned out to more or less be true. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, I mean, I wasn't reporting on it, but the kind of the same people who I had talked to for that story kind of reached back out a few months ago and they were like, you know, a lot of these staffers are going to be let go, and you know we're re, you know kind of this is a, this is a this is a problem for for DeSantis because they hadn't anticipated this and they kind of scaled too fast maybe, and you know they mm-hmm. were trying to measure for a long time how good how well their campaign was going by comparing it to Trump's campaign and saying oh you know Trump's headcount is X you know we have a similar headcount so we must be doing well as well which is kind of a real <laughs> you know, that's, that's not the metric folks <laughs> right. So that is I mean, not that the metric sort of how they were approaching it. And when they started, you know, laying people off, um, you know, when kind of when Politico was reporting, it was like a handful, like the reporting that we have was actually, it was a lot more and it was a lot deeper cuts. And actually what we have seen is that original team of people like Dave Abrams, Tucker Obenshane, those people who Casey thought would be good options have been let go. Right. Uh, and they are no longer on the campaign, which I think is very interesting. Yeah, a lot of them seem to be getting like handed over to government jobs now in Tallahassee, which I also find interesting because there may be, and I don't know if I'm, I, I may be overly playing out the, the the scenarios here, but they're putting a lot of these fired campaign staffers into government jobs and thinking, all right, we'll wait around, we'll keep our people together for a couple more years, and we'll see what happens, you know, which what shakes loose in twenty eight. <laughs> So, but back on the back on the Trump beat for a second. Um, what do you anticipate is the timing chain? What's the what's the? I mean, uh, I know Georgia is in the wind right now for for another indictment for the for the fourth major thread in this whole thing. Um, and, and I'm curious how you think and how you think Trump and his team prioritize the cases in their heads in terms of the risk they propose to him. There seems to be some like weird level of nervousness about Georgia that doesn't exist almost even in the January 6th thing. I've noticed that a couple times now that he's sort of uh, that he's sort of I, like Fannie Willis seems to rattle him a lot in some in some strange way. I think they see all of the cases differently. I think they see the New York hush money case as the least perilous. Uh, they see, I think, the documents case as really problematic, but uh, because of the, the classified information at stake, they feel like a they can mount some sort of defense around, you know, Presidential Records Act, and which is not a defense, by the way, it's got nothing to do with national no. security statutes. But no. you know, he thinks maybe that he can muddy a jury with that. And they also think that because of the the SIPA rules there, the, the Classified Information Procedures Act, which govern the use of classified materials at trial and kind of the very the complicated steps that his lawyers have to jump through, 
um, to and, and prosecutors have to jump through to get the trial. They think, oh, you know, that's still a ways away. I think the January 6th case that came down uh, last week looms very large in in kind of mm-hmm. Trump's psyche and his kind of his lawyer's psyche because that could theoretically go to trial much faster. And, right. um, you know, I think for him, it's always about timing, right? So whatever is coming first is going to be the, the first thing that they have to deal with. And that's where all their energies go. You know, what's their mantra? It's like, um, you know, just survive the day, right? They, they take it day by day and then, you know, whatever gets them first, they'll deal with and they'll, they'll keep rolling with it. I think the Fulton County indictment is different for him for various reasons. Number one, it's, it's um, the legal team is local. On all of the other cases, mm-hmm. it's, you know, his lawyers with him in New York or D.C. or Florida. In Georgia, he has three law- two or three lawyers who are based in Atlanta. They're not managed by Boris Epstein. They report directly to Trump in theory. Um, and they are good lawyers, but also because of the nature of how the special purpose grand jury works in, in Atlanta and because of the nature of how the kind of the regular investigative process works, they have not been very successful in any of their litigation um, mm-hmm. trying to disqualify Fannie Willis, trying to you know disqualify the, the special grand jury report. I think Fannie Willis also plays a very large role in his mind because he sees a really aggressive prosecutor who is out to get Trump. I mean, it's abundantly clear she's going to indict him. She is out to get Trump. She thinks what Trump did was criminal and they built this case <laughs> against them. It's not, there's no, sh- right. there's no facade of like, with right. Trump she doesn't, she's not playing. Him, she's you know, just like, punch- you did it. I, I'm no, coming. she's not playing. <laughs> well, um, and she's made no secret Hugo, about this and there's a lot of reporting. So I think, you know, yeah. I mean, and, and let's, let's be real also. I mean, she's an African American woman and I know that that cannot be, that, that is not, un, that is not um, a, a, a trivial fact. It's not lost on Trump, it. right? A lot of a lot of Trump's thinking about this. Well, Hugo, I wanted to thank you so much for coming on the enemies list today. While we were talking just now, I learned uh, it just broke that uh, Ron DeSantis has fired Janera Peck as campaign manager. So the meltdown, as we were discussing wow. previously, continues at speed and pace. So anyway, Hugo, thank you again for joining us on uh, on the enemies list. Give uh, people a way to find you on the various social media platforms. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Hugo Lowell. And if, if Threads is still a thing, then it's Hugo X Lowell on, on Threads. Threads is still a thing, man. It's it's like uh, pictures of cats and girlfriends. It's, it's sort of like my happy place. <laughs> less less hate and more like just like I I, don't even, I can't even quite put my finger on it. It's just like not as ponderous and full of Nazis and garbage. So Anyway, well, once again, Hugo, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. And uh, we'll we'll look forward to having you back because the campaign rolls on this year. Thanks again. Today on the enemies list, Mitch McConnell and a guy named Josh Holmes. Now, you haven't heard of Josh Holmes as a general rule, unless you listen to terrible podcasts or um, you're looking for the guy who runs a lobbying firm. that's a toll booth for McConnell and his chief political strategist. Mitch McConnell this weekend was out in his home state of Kentucky, and he started talking about whatever the hell was on his agenda. And the MAGA started to scream and boo and so retire, 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 retire. And McConnell tried to fumble his way through it. He's, he's, the guy's in very poor health, as we all know. Um, but Mitch McConnell and Josh Holmes made a decision way back in the days following the one terrorist attack on the Capitol. And at the time, Josh had a quote that I've I, I've kept uh, among my, my talismans for how badly Washington, D.C. Republicans never understood their moral obligation once Trump had, had inspired the 1-6 attack to remove him permanently from power. Josh said, if you can replicate his draw amongst rural working class voters without the insanity you have a permanent governing majority. You know what they learned this weekend? You can't represent, replicate anything with Trump without the insanity. The insanity isn't a feature or isn't a bug. It's a feature. The insanity is always there. Mitch McConnell got it in his face this weekend. You know what? I'm sorry. He's an old guy now. You shouldn't, you, you shouldn't, uh, you know, you almost want to feel pity for him up there 
having held the line for so long and so many things against the crazy. But he was also the guy that empowered Trump to hold on. He's also the guy who had every bit of the ability to tell the Republican caucus in the Senate exactly how he wanted them to vote and make them do it with like one or two asshole exceptions like Ron Paul or Rand Paul. Um, but he could have done it. He could have he could have allowed his members. He could have encouraged his members uh, after January 6th. Let's take up the impeachment. Let's get let's get this guy off the political stage forever. So this week, Mitch McConnell and Josh Holmes, because you've given us the gift that keeps on giving the political herpes, the metastasizing cancer that is Donald Trump, you're on the enemies list. Thanks again for listening to The Enemies List. If you have any comments, questions, or if there's someone you'd like to hear on the podcast, hit me up on Twitter at the Rick Wilson. Thanks again for the wonderful support you've shown the pod. We're growing fast. It really helps if you will share this with your friends, your family, and anyone else who, like us, is trying to save democracy. While you're at it, if you could rate and review the podcast, I would be very much appreciative. I know this is the sort of thing you've heard a billion times. Please rate, review, like, blah, blah, blah. But you need to do it. It really does help us a lot. We are slaves to the algorithm, my friends. And if you do this, it will help get the pod out further. Anyway, thanks again for listening. I'll see you next time. And remember, whatever you do, stay off the list.